It is Wednesday, November 15th, and this is The National. Tonight, CBC News goes inside private clinics to investigate an expensive and unproven treatment. An Ottawa teacher speaks out about how he was violently attacked in the classroom and what needs to change. But we begin with big changes to something Canadians have long seen as part of this country's identity. Canada as an international peacekeeper. It's something this country has celebrated for so long. It's practically stitched into the fabric. But as the world's conflicts changed, so too is the idea of what peacekeeping means for Canada. The Prime Minister made that much clear in announcing today the path forward. We know uh, that peace operations uh, now around the world carry greater risk uh, than they did 60, 70 years ago. Uh, this is the reality of modern peacekeeping. <laughs> we recognize that there are risks anytime we send women and men of the Canadian forces overseas, uh, but we also uh, pledge to those women and men and to their families and to all Canadians that we will do everything to make sure that both those risks are minimized and the impact of their efforts are maximized. So here's Canada's new commitment to the United Nations. As we reported Tuesday, $15 million to help recruit female soldiers and police officers for peacekeeping missions. The government's also making what it calls smart pledges to react when the UN needs help. A rapid response team of up to 200 Canadian troops, as well as helicopters, cargo planes, and military trainers for future peacekeeping operations. But what Trudeau didn't do is commit to an actual peacekeeping operation happening right now. And the promise he made today was very different from the one he made last year. So does this backtrack on Trudeau's message that Canada is back? Briar Stewart takes a look. Merci beaucoup. When Prime Minister Justin Trudeau finished outlining Canada's peacekeeping pledge, he received a standing ovation. In one country, we might... Later, he faced plenty of questions about how this plan aligns with the government's earlier promise to deploy 600 troops and 150 police officers. Canada is looking to have an impact beyond... Uh, the simple sending of uh, troops, which we will do. Instead of deploying to a specific mission, officials say the government will work with the UN to figure out what help is needed where. What this does uh, is leverage uh, the unique uh, skills of uh, a country that has one of the best militaries in the world to try and affect more than just that one spot that 600 people would affect. Canada is offering training and equipment like aircraft to the UN, which could be used by countries that have troops deployed to dangerous peacekeeping missions. Bangladesh has about 8,000 peacekeepers all over the world, and Lieutenant General Rahman says one of their biggest needs is medical uh, support. Equipments, new equipment uh, from other countries, uh, at the field hospital from other countries, and then uh, going to the mission area, these are going to help to a great extent. Another key part of the plan is to invest in getting more women into peacekeeping. Of the nearly 110,000 UN peacekeepers currently deployed around the world, just over 4% of them are women. In 2015, the UN set a goal to double that number, but it's barely moved. And officials acknowledge that's a problem. We know that um, women peacekeepers make peacekeeping more effective. They can talk um, to women and children, and they can therefore also um, uh, contribute a lot um, to protection of the civilian uh, population. Canada is starting a $15 million fund which countries can tap into to recruit more women. Officials are encouraging other countries to invest too, so that forces on the ground better represent the people that they're trying to protect. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Vancouver. Now, you heard Breyer mention, as of last month, there were 107,000 peacekeepers deployed worldwide. Canada's contribution? 62. The biggest contributor to UN peacekeeping right now is Ethiopia. Bangladesh and India round out the top three. And as for where they're going, most UN peacekeepers are deployed across Africa, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, South Sudan, Darfur, Mali, and the Central African Republic. And Adrian, I interviewed a former peacekeeper earlier today and asked him about all of this, what he thinks of the announcement and Canada's role on the international stage. We're going to hear from him a little bit later in the program. All right, Andrew, we are also watching the developing situation in Zimbabwe this evening. 
Because until last night, in the middle of the night, this man, 93-year-old Robert Mugabe, was the world's oldest leader and almost the longest-serving one, presiding over a Zimbabwe that has seemed in an almost constant state of crisis. Much of the crisis, his own doing. So what should pop up on the state broadcaster in the wee hours of the morning but this? To the generality of the people of Zimbabwe, we urge you to remain calm and limit unnecessary movement. We wish to make it abundantly clear that this is not a military takeover of government. But it sure looks like a military takeover. Mugabe and his wife Grace, called Gucci Grace by critics, are said to be in the military's hands under house arrest, but safe. Who is in charge now is not exactly clear. There were some reports of a gunfight, but today, armored vehicles and checkpoints aside, the streets were quiet. The Zimbabweans we reached today said the most interesting sounds were of people finally speaking their minds. You could hear people saying that uh, Tatora Nyika. Tatora Nyika means um, we have now um, uh, sorry, um, liberated ourselves. The country is now in our hands. That's what, the, that's what the people were saying. So they are trusting what the military is doing. They can now say what they want because uh, the police are no longer on the streets. People have long been afraid of Zimbabwe's police, of their looting and their violent oppression of dissenting voices. The military had a warning for the police today. To the other security services, we urge you to cooperate for the good of our country. Any provocation will be met with an appropriate response. And even those who were once Mugabe's most loyal agents, the so-called war veterans, have wandered. We urge that Robert Gabriel Mugabe should be recalled from his role as the president and first secretary of ZANU-PF. Zimbabweans could be forgiven for being afraid to hope for change. A 2008 election thought to have been won by the opposition ended with a violent crackdown by Mugabe. When I look around the situation in the country, I see a catastrophe. A power-sharing deal fell apart, and life has been really hard. At times, 4 million percent inflation, which looks like a loaf of bread costing a billion Zimbabwean dollars and doubling in price by the time you walk out of the store. We thank you. This time, though, change might just be real. Now, whether you call this a coup or, as some in Harare are saying, a bloodless correction, it seems to be triggered by a rivalry between Zimbabwe's former vice president and its first lady, Grace Mugabe. Grace was Mugabe's secretary and mistress. They were married soon after his first wife died. She was known for her lavish spending, but she's also built her own political faction. In an apparent bid for power last week, she urged Mugabe to fire his vice president, Emerson Mungagwa. Clearly, he didn't go quietly. Mangagwa's nickname is the Crocodile, the country's spy master through the bloody 1980s with deep roots in the military. It's no secret he wanted to be Mugabe's successor, and now he might just have his chance. And you know, Ian, there will absolutely be a lot more to come in, in the days ahead because the rumors are, are completely rife about what's next. And as you mentioned, this is a story that develops overnight, so as we get into the Thursday morning hours, we'll see if there are more developments just uh, over this last night. Thanks, Adrian. You bet. An Ottawa high school teacher is calling this the worst day of his long and beloved career. That is the day he was attacked by a student inside his classroom. And tonight, he and his wife are speaking out. There's not a day that goes by that we're not reminded of it. At some level, either he's in pain or he has an appointment or he's reminded of it. Um, he doesn't sleep well at night. Um, it's, there's an everyday reminder of what happened. They told their story to the CBC's Ashley Burke and shared their concerns about whether the school system is really equipped to handle students with behavioral issues while also protecting educators. Where is bothering the most right now? Right, right in. Seven months later, Tony LaMonica is still recovering from a violent attack. Well, there's not a day goes by that uh, I don't think about what happened. He spent 32 years as a proud high school teacher. 
until his career ended suddenly on a hospital stretcher. It was uh, April 10th, and I heard uh, a disturbance out in the hallway. He found a 17-year-old male student hovering over a female student. He took her into his office for safety. He threw me across a table. I slammed my hip uh, on the table. I f slid across the table and landed on the other side on the floor. I looked up and then I saw the student reach behind and pick up a, a heavy upholstered office chair and had it over his head and was right over about to throw it on me. And thank God he changed his mind. He turned around and threw it in the other direction. This is the gap that's uh, not healing properly. LaMonica's wife couldn't believe he shattered his hip and tore his rotator cuff. He was basically bedridden. It was heartbreaking. While recovering, LaMonica learned the same student had been suspended for another alleged violent incident a week earlier. I wasn't kept safe. Police laid four charges against the student, including aggravated assault. But LaMonica now worries other teachers could be harmed and feels forgotten. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. LaMonica's union, which represents Ontario's English Catholic teachers, is one of the few that tracks student on teacher violence. In a survey of its teachers, it found nearly two thirds have personally experienced violence on the job. 70% say they've witnessed it. And in some cases, the violence involved a weapon. The union says it also heard from many teachers that they were discouraged by school officials from filing a report or calling police. We are in the midst of a national public health crisis and no one group or government can address it alone. The national public health crisis the federal health minister is referring to is the opioid epidemic. It's a serious issue that we've been following closely here on The National, one that's had devastating effects on families and communities across this country. And this is why eight people die every single day in this country from opioid overdoses. And today the health minister admitted she has no idea when the situation will start to improve. Ottawa did outline new measures to try to turn the tide. The CBC's Catherine Cullen joins us now from Ottawa. And, and Catherine, what is the government going to be doing? Well, Ian, Jeanette Pettipaw-Taylor does have a long laundry list, 40 different measures that the government has already announced. We're talking about things from new supervised drug use sites to better data collection, but none of it is stopping this crisis. Now she's going to try some more dramatic measures, like a pilot project to give people who are about to take street drugs a safer pharmaceutical alternative. That's already being tried by groups in Vancouver and Ottawa. It is consulting about making it easier to prescribe methadone, and the federal government wants to make it easier to approve those temporary overdose prevention sites, the pop-up tents that we've seen in some cities. So the health minister choosing to make this announcement at a big addictions conference in Calgary. Lots of experts were there. And, and how did they react? Well, I spoke to one expert who said this is a step in the right direction, but she and some others say the government has to do more. We absolutely need to decriminalize uh, minor possession in this country. Stigma is a huge barrier for people to access treatment and care. People are dying at home alone because they're using alone because they don't want to disclose they're using. Until we decriminalize drugs, we will not end stigma and it's needed now. Last week on The National, Catherine, we heard from some mothers of addicts who say that drugs like cocaine and heroin need to be made legal so they can be inspected by the government to ensure they're free of fentanyl. What's the government's perspective on that? Well, you're talking about legalization, Ian. Even decriminalization is clearly a non-starter. Listen to this exchange today. Our government has made it clear that we have no plans of decriminalizing uh, drugs. However, we do want to work with individuals and we want to have innovative solutions to come up with ways to effectively deal with this. Again, it's not just one solution. We have to work with all levels of government and all agencies in order to effectively well, deal with this. Out. We've indicated, to, we've made it clear that, that at this point in time, it's not an issue that we're looking at. I understand that. Yeah. Well, why, why not? <laughs> because that we are exploring other avenues right now. So basically the response is we're not doing it because we're doing other things. There isn't really a clear answer there, Ian. And, you know, even though those mothers I spoke to say they know this would be tough for the government to do, even though it would clearly save some lives. But take us through the, the political challenge, Catherine. Well, Ian, consider that even legalizing marijuana, something that most Canadians support, that comes with political challenges. But decriminalizing hard drugs does not have the same level of public support. We're also talking about substances that are much 
more dangerous than marijuana. This is not something that this government has shown any interest in getting involved in. All right, Catherine, thank you. So here's what else we're having a look at tonight on The National. From Brexit to scandals, the British Prime Minister is under fire from all sides. We'll break down Theresa May's very bad month. We'll also take you inside Canada's number one restaurant and show you exactly what it takes to stay on top. And Canadians are spending thousands of dollars on stem cell treatments that are unproven. CBC News investigates. They suggested at the stem cell clinic that I should try another treatment. We really don't know uh, whether these work and we really don't know how safe this approach is. It is, it's not the fact that it's abysmal, it's the fact we got out of the business. And, and, and we got out of the business because we concentrated in other areas, okay. But were we not able to do more than just concentrating those other areas? When I was in, in Africa, I needed a battalion. And I was told there was no battalion because they were in Bosnia, right? And in ex-Yugoslavia. At the time, there were more people killed, injured, internally displaced and refugeed in Rwanda, where I only was able to keep about 400 troops than in all of Yugoslavia. And we put 67,000 troops. So there is a problem of adjusting it, but the adjustment comes not purely from the political, it comes from the ground up and the ones who are being ground, grinded into the ground, and that's the young people. And so the young people are being used as weapons of war on one side, and on the other side, we're totally ignoring their screams. Well, you can't have it both ways. And now with the youth empowered with technology and with, a, with I call them the, uh, the generation without borders, they're already global. They're going to pu start pushing people aside, and they're start to be. They're going to become real, ardent activists in change. Should we get back into the business? You say we got out of the business of peacekeeping. Do we need to get back into the business of peacekeeping? I think that the, that as an example, the young people are recognizing that there is capabilities that should be exercised beyond our borders. And so there are different means of doing that. And I think that the UN is one of those instruments that should be used by Canada in order to engage internationally. We're a world power. We're a world leading middle power. It is unconceivable that we hold our capabilities within our borders. We're gonna be held accountable by history. When we see them being slaughtered by tens of thousands, when we see them being abused by hundreds of thousands, and that we have capabilities that we're holding back. On The National Tonight, investigators are trying to explain how a young Canadian woman and her friend both turned up dead in Cambodia. The woman's name is Abby Amisola, 27 years old. She and her friend were found unresponsive at a hostel yesterday morning. Cambodian officials think they may have taken too much medication the night before for severe stomach issues, a deadly overdose. Amisola was a substitute teacher in Winnipeg. Her family is now working to get her body back home. Another story we're following tonight. What's next for an Alberta couple found guilty in the death of their 18-month-old son? Instead of taking him to a doctor when he got sick, they treated him with garlic, onion, and other natural remedies. He ended up dying of meningitis. And today, a court of appeal upheld their conviction on failing to provide the necessities of life. They can technically still appeal, though, to the Supreme Court of Canada. Down south, U.S. President Donald Trump is back in Washington tonight after 12 days abroad, and he's facing lots of questions about Roy Moore, the Republican Senate candidate accused of sexual misconduct. But so far, no official comment from Trump. Thank you all. Should Roy Moore resign, Mr. President? But while Trump isn't talking, his daughter sure is. Here's what Ivanka Trump had to say in an interview with the Associated Press. There's a special place in hell for people who prey on children. I've yet to see a valid explanation, and I have no reason to doubt the victim's accounts. And a heartbreaking day in Texas. Thousands of people showed up to say goodbye to eight members of the same family. They were killed in last week's church massacre in Sutherland Springs. 
One of the few survivors of the attack was the one presiding over the service. His pregnant wife and three of her children were among those buried today. Adrian, over to you. Okay. After five weeks out of class, Andrew, thousands of Ontario post-secondary students are fed up, caught in the middle of a province-wide faculty strike involving 24 colleges. They're frustrated that they're paying tuition and getting nothing in return. Some have joined a class action suit asking for tuition refunds for all that lost instruction. But it's not just tuition causing the angst. For some, that strike could jeopardize work placements or even jobs. Olivia Stefanovic spoke to some of the students today. Open the file. Without teachers, Bibi Ahmed and her classmates meet to learn on their own. Because it's easier to do this than sit home and do nothing. Ahmed has an upcoming office administration placement at a hospital that's now on the line. An opportunity that may be jeopardized if the Ontario College teachers strike drags on. It's actually very overwhelming and stressful because five weeks into it, we've had our break, we've relaxed, and now it's like, what's going on, what's going to happen? That question is also on Desiree Yo's mind. It's like the first time I actually got out of high school and I'm on my own and everything. So like after hearing the strike, it kind of conflict me because like I couldn't do my midterms, I couldn't do tests. Yo says it's better to prepare than to kick back and wait for the strike to be over. But she's finding it difficult to study independently. I have a hard time like I need I need to be I need to have someone to teach me. I can't focus. Tucked away in another corner of the library is Wadia Wawa. She came to Canada this fall from Port-au-Prince for a business marketing diploma. Now she's stuck far from home with no classes. It's driving me nuts. <laughs> it's driving me nuts. I want I like, I want I, I don't like school, but I'm begging to come back right now. I really want to come back to school. Students at St. Clair's College rallied. Dina L'Esperance was in the crowd. She recently took out a loan to upgrade her skills and enrolled in a three-year program in chemical lab technology. I quit my job. I had a very good job. And I don't have any other form of income. I'm relying on this second opportunity to live my dream, to set an example for my daughter. And now I'm at risk of losing my home. L'Esperance may get relief if teachers accept the college's latest contract offer. But that may be unlikely. The results of their vote are expected tomorrow, but the College Teachers Union is urging members to vote no. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Toronto. So the rising cost of education also brought students out into the streets of Lung London, England today. The Conservative government says it wants to cap university fees to take the financial pressure off students, but the protesters say that is not nearly enough. Instead, they want free education by taxing the rich. And they called for the Tories to reverse a decade of cuts to the education system. Now, education is just one of the files that Theresa May's government can't seem to handle in a way that makes anybody happy. The growing consensus of opinion on her leadership could best be described as, well, let's let her critics speak for themselves. Mr. Speaker, earlier in the year, the Prime Minister told the country that she was the only person that could offer strong and stable leadership in the national interest with her cabinet crumbling before her eyes can she tell us how it's going just another in the series of withering assaults on the british prime minister in today's question period her increasingly unpopular and divided conservative government is struggling to put it mildly over brexit the economy you name it that theresa may is under siege is beyond doubt some wonder how she's politically survived this long and whether she can last much longer. Margaret Evans takes a closer look at May and the series of disasters that have led to this point. Oh, Theresa. Theresa May, that is, the British Prime Minister. Betting agencies here are offering five to one odds that she won't make it to the end of the year before being forced out. So what's the problem? Well, to begin with, the pound has dropped again. And that's just after a report in the Sunday Times that 40 Conservative MPs are willing to sign a letter of no confidence in May. 
That's still short of the number needed to force her to step down, but it's more than enough to make her worry. Many Conservative MPs have been angry at her since last June, when she called a snap election she didn't need to and lost them their majority. Five months later, the overwhelming image of her government is of one in meltdown. Last week, May was forced to lose two cabinet ministers, her defense secretary who's facing allegations of sexual harassment and the international development minister who admitted to 12 secret meetings with Israeli officials while she was on holidays and not a word to her prime minister. Next stop, the foreign secretary, May's nemesis, Boris Johnson, the one with all the hair. Despite blunder after blunder, he's still in his job and after hers. But May is seen as too weak to remove him because he was a key campaigner to leave the European Union. That brings us to the elephant in the room, Brexit. The British Parliament, just across the river here, is this week debating what's known as the EU withdrawal bill. But negotiations are far from over. Nobody actually paid any attention to what leaving actually meant. In and rebel Conservatives are threatening to back Labour MPs who say May is trying to avoid giving Parliament a final say on a deal. <laughs> So why is May still standing? Partly because she simply doesn't give up. It's just not in her nature. But mainly because there's no clear or potentially healing alternative in her own party. The paralysis over the EU and Brexit is nothing new for the Conservative Party. It was ever thus, and it haunts them still. Neither faction strong enough to break the internal deadlock. That's why some pundits here say May is going nowhere, that she's gone from her old campaign adage of strong and stable, strong strong and stable, stable leadership. leadership to weak but stable. Margaret Evans, CBC News, <clears throat> London. Still ahead tonight, we go inside private clinics to investigate an unproven treatment. Plus, a bidding frenzy at a New York auction for a Da Vinci painting and a $450 million price tag. We'll also show you the moment when Drake stopped a concert to help a fan and make a point. In 1956, when war broke out in the Suez Canal region, Lester B. Pearson, foreign minister at the time, recommended the creation of an emergency force in a last-ditch effort to secure peace in the area. My own country now maintains forces trained and equipped which can be placed at the disposal of the United Nations on short notice for service anywhere in the world. The United Nations agreed. It became the first ever peacekeeping force and a blueprint for the future. Canada is a middle power. We're known as a nation that expresses goodwill towards others. We don't have colonial baggage. We have a multicultural society. In many ways, Canadian peacekeepers set the gold standard. Canada was the largest contributor to peacekeeping during the Cold War and for the first few years afterwards. During the the era when peacekeeping missions had a great deal of success, uh, they were basically watching uh, peace uh, that had been declared or tense truces that were on the edge. Missions were mostly straightforward, maintain the peace. The Cyprus, which uh, uh, in 1974, I believe, the UN sent a mission into Cyprus when Greece and Turkey nearly came to a war. Uh, all the powers of the world wanted peace on that island. Peacekeeping went in and peacekeeping has functioned there largely peacefully. Then, turmoil in Yugoslavia changed the game entirely. Do I want to go there? <laughs> if it'll get food into uh, the civilians that are there and need it, yeah, I'll go. It's not that I want to go, but in, uh, in the aid of other people, I will. Contrast that with the peacekeeping that happened after the fall of communism in 1991, where you had the former Yugoslavia, for instance. Peace missions were sent in and very quickly uh, evolved into uh, desperate attempts to prevent mass civil war, genocide, terror attacks, and really be became combat situations. 
what was once a mission to maintain the peace that was already in place became a mission to create it. Rwanda, 1993-94, uh, where you again led to, into a, a complete breakdown of order. The peacekeeping mission was swept aside by uh, people intent on genocide. In Somalia in 1993, uh, 94, which again ended in uh, chaos. So you get one mission after another after the end of the kind of solidity of the Cold War that, uh, that has ended in extremely fraught conditions. By 2001, Canada's mission looked a lot less like peacekeeping and a little more like combat. With the Conservative Party, um, basically uh, up until last year, there was quite a distaste, I think, for peacekeeping. A saying began to creep in, if there is uh, peace, then why do you need peacekeepers? If there's no peace, then peacekeepers can't enforce it. But last year, the Liberals were elected with a promise to get back into peacekeeping, or a modern version of it anyway. Our, our troops, our development workers, our diplomats uh, are extraordinarily valuable on the world stage and uh, we're always being asked to do more. It's part self-interest and part national pride and, and uh, a certain sense that we'll probably do a good job of it. But these kinds of missions may be much different than those of the past. The missions are more dangerous, they uh, are more robust, they are more multidimensional. There is a threat of IED, improvised explosive devices. Um, this can happen similarly as an Afghan. It has been 21 years since the UN first promised to address sexual abuse by UN peacekeepers and to increase the number of women deployed in operations. Yet, the exploitation of defenseless civilians still takes place, and still less than 4% of all peacekeepers are women. Angelina Jolie was in Vancouver today and gave the keynote address at the peacekeeping conference. She's urging the United Nations to renew its efforts to stop sexual violence in war, and she thanked the Canadian government for its leadership on women, peace, and security. Now, Jolie's praise aside, Canada has been criticized for lagging behind on peacekeeping. And today, it responded with a new plan, but new missions were not a part of it. So it's not clear if it'll be enough to convince the world to give Canada a seat on the UN Security Council. And that could be an uphill battle, considering how far away Canada is from its peacekeeping heyday. How can we get from them the support and cooperation which is required? It all started with Lester B. Pearson, considered the father of international peacekeeping. He proposed the first official force, even won a Nobel Peace Prize for it back in 1957. All of that before becoming Canada's Prime Minister. An airlift of a thousand Canadian troops to a Mediterranean hotspot, Cyprus. And pretty soon, this country's blue berets were being sent to places all over the world, like Congo and Cyprus. And the notion that we, as a nation, were keeping worldwide peace became sewn into the fabric of our national identity. Fall out the officers! But over time, things changed, and pretty dramatically in the 1990s. Peacekeeping became tainted. Canadian soldiers in Somalia were accused of torture and murder. They stood helpless, bearing witness to atrocities of the most savage kind in Rwanda, and they came back broken. And there were these demoralizing moments, as one of Canada's own was taken hostage in Bosnia, so by the early 2000s, things changed. Canada scaled back its peacekeeping contributions, opting for military aid instead. Now that difference is not a small one. Violence used to be a last resort in peacekeeping, but that's not often the case anymore. Earlier today, I talked to someone who has firsthand experience with that change, an army reservist and a former peacekeeper in Bosnia. And I wanted to hear where he thinks Canadian peacekeeping is going in the modern era. Have a listen. What do you think Canadians think of when they think about peacekeeping? I think most Canadians have a bit of a, a dated, um, rose-colored glass version of what is peacekeeping from the 1950s, the era of Lester Pearson, and when peacekeeping was between two warring nations with a, an agreement in place 
and Blue Berets were stuck in the middle of them to guarantee that peace where no fighting would carry on. And how's peacekeeping changed? Those conflicts became messier, bloodier? Definitely. Much more aggressive, much more violent, uh, and much more complicated to deal with because it was simply wasn't dealing with uh, the, due, the due representative of a nation state to potentially find a, a peaceful resolution. When you look at what the government has announced today, do you feel like that upholds the legacy of what Canada has, has spent decades building? I don't think it lets the legacy down in any way. I think it's providing unique capabilities that in many cases are missing from uh, modern peace support operations. A lot of the, the boots on the ground are provided by developing nations in a lot of cases. Um, what those developing nations uh, have lots of in many cases are soldiers. What they often lack is technological capability or the ability to uh, do transport over a wide area, provide communications, intelligence, uh, detailed comprehensive training. Uh, these are all skills that Canada can bring to bear. But, but I mean, tell me if I'm wrong. I mean, is, is there not a sense, even at least internationally, that, that, that Canada has, has lost some of the prestige or, or, or the importance on the international scene that, that perhaps it once held? I mean, if you look back several decades. Um, I personally don't take that view. Realistically, we are engaged around the world. We may not be engaged wearing a blue beret and peace peace support operations working directly under a UN mandate, but ultimately we are engaged in, in operations with a larger intent to peace and stability around the world. So whether it's wearing a balloon beret or it's whether it's under a NATO mandate, in my opinion, is, is almost uh, splitting hairs. You don't sleep at night. Uh, I was tired, couldn't do things that I wanted to do anymore. Um, I just in pain all the time. Pain in your knees or hips? Many Canadians can't seem to escape it, and for some, the desperation is driving them to try something faster and simpler than surgery. Stem cell injections offered in clinics across the country, but do they work and are they safe? Well, Kelly Crow has been investigating the surge in these private stem cell clinics, and uh, as I say, a lot of people here are driven by desperation. Right, and they're paying thousands of dollars for this unproven treatment where tissue is sucked out of their fat or bone marrow and it's injected back into their aching joints. The theory is that there are stem cells in the bone marrow and the fat tissue and those stem cells have some sort of healing capacity. But we asked a prominent Canadian stem cell scientist for his opinion, Dr. Duncan Stewart, and here's what he had to say. If a patient called me up to say that... Uh they are thinking of going to get this kind of therapy from a practitioner offering it like this for, uh, for a fee. I would say that, uh, that I don't think that's wise. Uh, I don't think they know they're going to get any benefit. I think they're taking a potential risk. And, and all of these therapies should be offered within the context of a properly designed clinical trial. Still, lots of Canadians are going for it. We took a hidden camera into a few private clinics to see how stem cell procedures are being offered to patients. Okay, if you grab a seat, I'll let you know. The patient we followed has a painful knee. She went online to a Toronto stem cell clinic and filled out a form. Within days, she had an appointment with an orthopedic surgeon who told her she had arthritis. So you have arthritis in your knee. Which means what? Which means that you have lost some cartilage. So. He said stem cell injections could help. He says it works most of the time. So yeah, how effective? About eighty percent of people. More, many more people than not are helped by it. Morning. At a different clinic, this family doctor also does stem cell injections, and she tells our patient that the injections are one hundred percent effective. So I'm not anybody not get significantly better. But stem cell experts say those reports of benefit are not supported by good scientific evidence. We really don't know uh, whether these work, and we really don't know how safe this approach is. There's so much to talk about here, but let's focus for a moment on stem cells. We hear about them. They seem so magical. What are they? Well, stem cells are special cells that can develop into different types of cells. No other cell can do that. And ever since they were first discovered in the early 1960s, scientists have been studying whether they could be used to regenerate bone or tissue or even hearts or other organs. So big debate here about the benefits of this. What about the risks? Right. Well, there's a risk of infection from the injections. And in the U.S., three people have gone blind after having stem cell injections into their eyes to treat macular degeneration. 
If stem cells do what scientists think they might, and that's trigger the growth of new tissue, there's also a theoretical risk that it could cause the growth of unwanted tissue and even cancerous tumors. Dr. Duncan Stewart is conducting clinical trials, and when he signs up volunteers, he has to tell them about that risk. If you read the kind of consent forms that we put together for our trials, you'll, you'll see all this language. It's kind of scary because there's a theoretical risk that there could be tumors that form. Um, there's a theoretical risk you could get blood vessels forming where you don't want them to form, for instance, the back of the eye or other places. So all these things could happen. So it's interesting, right? We heard those two people earlier talk about, what, 80% success, 100% success. But there's a lot of research still to be done here. Right. I mean, scientists just don't know right now whether injecting stem cells into the body is an effective way to treat injury. The whole concept is still being tested in clinical trials, and that means so far there's no good evidence that it works or that what the patients are even experiencing is anything more than just a placebo effect. But we discovered that patients are being told that these treatments work much of the time and that different doctors have a different idea what's going on in the body. Let's go back to our hidden camera. Or you can have an injection of stem cells. So right. take, a, take a sample. Here, the orthopedic surgeon tells our patient that the cells do not regenerate tissue, just that they help with pain. Now, it really just acts as a, an anti-inflammatory. It takes away the pain. Okay. It won't regrow cartilage in your neck. The stem cell won't no. grow cartilage. No. Okay. These, so, are, these are treatments for pain. But the family doctor says the stem cell injections do cause new cartilage to grow. If it's more like mild, moderate, or severe arthritis, then, you know, stem cells may be a better right. option because that's regenerative to try and get the cartilage back. Okay, so what is that? Some people do claim to get a benefit. Adele Engel spent about $5,000 for injections to treat osteoarthritis in both knees. It's the mother load of all pain when they <laughs> aspirate the, um, the stem cells out of your hip. She's had it done twice. Really what I have found is the first procedure, I felt I got significant improvement. The second procedure where we used the fat tissue, the adipose tissue, it just didn't work as well for me. Rick McGregor paid almost $2,000 for stem cell injections in his knee. I think they were using a small rubber hammer to pound the, the needle into your bone. And then when they start sucking it out, it hurts. The injections didn't work, so he went for knee replacement surgery instead. They suggested at the stem cell clinic that I should try another treatment first but I'd already put out the $1,700 with no results and I wasn't sure I was ready to put out the more money. So the patients have two different stories. The doctors obviously at odds on this. So what about Health Canada? Okay, well, Health Canada in an email said exactly this. Health Canada approval is required before any cell therapy can be legally used on human patients. So far, we know Health Canada has sent letters to six clinics doing stem cell injections, just asking for information. And we also know that there are more than six uh, clinics across Canada doing the procedures. So far, none of them have been told to stop doing the injections. And so what should we be looking for next? Well, there's a risk that more clinics will start offering the procedure. Um, and and uh, it might not always be doctors and surgeons doing them, possibly naturopaths, chiropractors, and other types of practitioners could start offering them too. In the U.S., the FDA has started to crack down, but so far Health Canada has not indicated what, if any, regulatory action it's going to take. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Coming up, we will take you behind the scenes of the most prestigious restaurant in this country. Come on, come on. A 200-yard stroll separates the U.S. and Russia at Expo. This is an easy location for that fascinating comparison that thousands make here each day, sometimes waiting an hour in line to do it. The Russians seem determined to show the visitor as much as possible. One official told me, everyone knows what America can do. We have to show what we can do. And it's all here from atomic icebreakers to power stations. There's a plush restaurant, too. Caviar, vodka, borscht, smoked salmon, and just about every day, a stage show. 
This one, an Estonian group showing that music knows no boundaries. The most impressive part of the American approach is the pavilion building itself. Inside, secure in their industrial achievements and efficiency, the Americans seem to say, you know what we can do. This is just for fun. So there's cowboys, Indians, rag dolls, movie stars, Elvis Presley's guitar, Debbie Reynolds' bed, vinyl skirted hostesses, and the longest escalator in the world. The one really serious note is an impressive display of space achievements. It's a fresh, light-hearted approach, with a mini-rail running zanily through the middle, but it leaves some visitors feeling vaguely unfulfilled. The Russian pavilion, by comparison, is impressive, but some complain ponderous and overbearing. Whatever their reaction, most people feel they just have to see both. Terry Hargreaves, CBC News, at Expo 67. <laughs> Welcome to Expo 67, to Man and His World. This is the Canadian Pavilion. Canada is a complex country, diverse in heritage, and the pavilion is a reflection of this diversity. Doesn't tell the whole story of what we are, So it's always just pushing for excellence and getting better, and hopefully, because we weren't busy right when we first started, right? So let's try to get busy. The third floor of a building above a body piercing studio isn't exactly where you'd expect to find Canada's number one restaurant, but that's where Chef Patrick Chris decided to open Allo, a modern French joint now named 2017's Restaurant of the Year. So just what does it take to earn that honor? Take a look. Give him a heads up, we got a bunch of beef coming up. Table nine, please. Service. Bring the fish in a minute. Come on, come on. Uh, our first night, we did 21 people. And then our first big review opened up the floodgates. Service, service. Smells like that. Yeah. I'm more aware of the expectations than the actual number one. I don't want it to go to my head. I don't want to, like, kind of sit on it and be like, yeah, we'll always be busy. But I don't really believe in that. You know, there's always another restaurant that's going to open, and could be better than us, so we have to keep pushing and make things even better for the guests. I said, holy shit. <laughs> People have been trying to get in for a long time, and we want to fulfill those expectations or exceed them and uh, give everyone a great dining experience. I go 10, go 10. Two beef, two bread, guys, and you got four oyster behind. Two and I'm usually here between 9.30 and 10.30. Mm -hmm. good. Did he not square in here? Zero. They work hard for you. They work hard here. How are you? <laughs> good, how are you? First person gets here at six. Bartenders leave at three. So there's someone here almost for 24 hours for a dinner service that lasts 
from 5.15 until last person sits at 10. It's intense. It's We required a certain standard, but you see you hanging around with us for a bit. It's pretty calm. It's, it's, <laughs> it's tiring, but it's, it's a love. So the dish I'm putting together is one of our starters, I guess you would say, on our tasting menu. It's not too tweezery, but we do use tweezers a lot. But <laughs> yeah, you want the food to be beautiful, right? It's a very beautiful product we bring in here, so we want that to show on the plate. So this here is finger lime. It's almost like caviar. You bite it and it like pops in your mouth. So it's nice and fresh and tasty. My favorite thing to eat is probably cheeseburgers and pizza with anchovies. I don't see it as elitist, it's just, we're cooking. We're just cooking a different style of food than what most people cook. Instead of having one big 16 ounce rib steak, we give a little three ounce piece because we feel that's enough after you've had some salmon and uh, some caviar. Is it okay for you? need more bread. The last one was last like, one was so horrible. Yeah. That was with our house, but I'm not Gross. Okay. Let's start. Yeah. We've tried the bread, prob this new bread, probably 10 to 12 times. And we'll try it again tomorrow. This one. This one's better. Yeah. Good. This one's yeah. better. Yeah. See the smellier, it's a good palate. I use them for a palate. See, it tastes everything. Listen up, the first reservation at table 11 is at 5.30 for two. Celebrating a 10-year anniversary. First reservation is under Melissa at 7 o'clock for four. And the counter, we have seven people. 8.30 for two people. Uh, let's remember that they're both pescatarian. They both drink still water. And they love starting with champagne. It's kind of like um, in the, being in the, the war room um, or being in the, in the dressing room before the game is about to begin. Table eight, we'll be bringing a Collins glass as he arrives, right? He likes his Collins glass filled with ice, lime on the side, and sparkling water. You have that salmon for the bar, yeah? Yes, sir. It's meticulous and it's very organized. So everyone has a job to do and that's their job all night. Kiwi is so if they're making option. scallops, okay. that's their job all night. If they're doing the canopy, that's their job all night long. Um, it is very repetitive, but that's your job. So you have to do it the same every single time. Table nine, kiwi allergy, severe, deathly. Fire six pasta. Great. Bring out two and then we'll go to two seven, okay? Great. Just the one person's answering it, it means that they're not doing a very good job. Service. Come on, man, I got this. Okay. Can you turn the lights down? It's too bright in here. I don't yell just to hear myself talk. Only when it's warranted. Hey, come here. This guy doesn't is not allowed to polish right now. That's your fault because he shouldn't be letting him in there by himself, but he doesn't know what to do. They work I don't like telling someone time. twice, but a mistake. Is there brown butter on this? Yeah, I understand people make mistakes. You do it once and you learn from it and we move on. But if it's like happening two, three, four times, I don't like that. Let's go salmon, potato, how long? Don't fire two beef. Don't, they're not even set. Just calm down, okay? Guys, let's go table nine, please. No, let's get it. We're happy with the night. It's smooth, it's smooth. The team's working well together. The front of the house is on point. The annual Canada's 100 Best Restaurants list is judged by more than 80 of the country's top chefs, restaurateurs, and other food industry insiders. Later this week on The National, world leaders are in Germany working out the final plans to implement the landmark Paris Climate Accord, signed two years ago. But in Prince Edward Island, some of the cattle are way ahead of them. So we just walk along, we just shake a little bit in the ground. So it's really just sprinkling on top of the, yep. the feed that you already have. Yeah. It's a bit of a 
it's weird a different, idea. It's a different though, right? idea, for sure. And, uh, you know, we said, well, we'll give it a try. The predominant feeling among the Europeans of Central Africa is that time is running out. Here, where only 70 years ago, Cecil Rhodes and his band of pioneers planted the Union Jack and pacified the natives, the words partnership and multiracialism are the last hope of 300,000 white men living among 7 million black men. Very few reckoned African nationalism to be a serious thing. A series of independent African states changed the map of Africa from imperial pink to independence green. In southern Rhodesia, white men were talking of reforms that a few years before would have got them chucked out of the club. And two new words entered the vocabulary of the European Rhodesian, multiracialism and partnership. But was it too late? Robert Mugabe of the Zimbabwe African People's Union. Well, we are totally opposed to the concept of multiracialism because it um, assumes in the first instance that the people have got to be arranged in uh, um, uh, compartments uh, based on color. You have Europeans in one compartment, Asians and coloreds in two other compartments, and the Africans in another compartment. And immediately you talk of multiracialism, you are um, accepting as a starting point that the races are different, and this difference must be recognized. We are non-racialist in our approach. That is, we regard as an, an individual as an indivi individual, and that uh, everybody must be accorded his full political rights, whether he be white or black, educated or uneducated, rich or poor. And this is exactly why we are, at the moment, struggling to earn for our people one man, one vote. Partnership and multiracialism were first mentioned in 1953. Desegregation of Salisbury's first bar took place three months ago. It's not quite apartheid, but the races are separated by legislation. This is Harare African Township, and if you are an African, you live in a township, unless you're a houseboy and have your own private hut at the bottom of somebody's garden. The government says the basis of true partnership is education. So far, not a single school in southern Rhodesia and the entire federation has been integrated. And the masterpiece continues for Mark McMorris. Ooh-wee! Max Paro. Now it doesn't get any more perfect than that. Kids, watch and learn. Your time begins now. And so, ladies and gentlemen, we move to the Leonardo da Vinci, the Sabato Mundi. On The National tonight, the sale the art world's been waiting for and its record-smashing outcome. On the auction block, Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi. Now, everyone expected a big price tag, but this? At 190 million, give me 200. 190 is bid. 200 million is bid. At 200 million. At 200 million. The gasps got louder as the bids got higher, 200 million, 300 million, back and forth by phone, until the final one. At $370 million, ladies and gentlemen. 400 million. <laughs> and the piece is sold. That's right, $400 million. Puts the old record to shame. A Picasso that sold for almost 180 million. Christie's has not revealed. Tonight's buyer. In a month when we've been talking nonstop about sexual assault and harassment, one Canadian icon today decided he had had enough. This is Sydney, Australia, and this is Drake, you're about to see, stopping his set after seeing a man touch women in the crowd. And what he did is our moment of the day. <laughs> Yeah. 
Gentlemen, why don't we let that moment speak for itself? This is The National for November 15th. Good night. Good night.